Good morning. I know you're smiling under your mask. Uh, it's so good to see you. And uh, I just want to say, I know it's an act of bravery to come to chapel. And uh, I'm so thankful that you're here. Uh, it's an honor to be here during Spiritual Emphasis Week. And thank you to Pastor Greg, to President Taylor, to all the faculty and staff. Th- these sort of weeks, just so you know, these sort of weeks when I was in Bible college were really impactful for me. So my prayer has been that they would also impact you and that what's said is not just going to be someone with a sense of certainty from the platform that's just uh, telling you what I think, but actually my goal this week is to stir your curiosity about God because the more curious you are, the more you pursue. Uh, When I'm curious about my wife, I still pursue her. I want to know more things about her, okay? If you're curious about dating someone, you need to ask questions. Don't act like you know them because they'll not go on a date with you and they'll use social distancing as the excuse. But I want your curiosity about God to be stirred and I want you to have compassion with yourself and with others. So that's the aim. I, that's the menu, okay? I'm the waiter that's walking up to the table saying, here's what's on the menu this week. That's it, is curiosity about God, compassion for yourself and others. And here's why. Because it is the greatest commandment that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. So that's what we're in for. Let me uh, show you my family here. This, this is my family. So as I say, I'm praying for you, and then you hear stories about my life, and you're like, I don't know if your prayers actually work at this point in your life. Those other ones are praying for you too, okay? Those are my two daughters and my beautiful wife, Lisa, who's here. Now, in full disclosure, I left out a member of our family um, intentionally, and then I felt convicted that I should show you who this is. That's Diggory. That's the other man. You didn't even do that for my daughters. That's the other uh, member of my family. Diggory and I have like a love-hate-hate relationship. He's just a lot bigger than I thought he was going to be, and he's much bigger than he was when he was a puppy. And you go, well, that's the thing. Yeah, I, I know that's the thing, but it, it's created this weird relationship between us. We've been praying for you, so um, so thankful that you're here. Let me pray for us, and then we'll get into uh, the message. Thank you, God, for the space you've given us. This is I believe, a safe space. God, I believe this is a space where we come to learn from you, and I pray even when we have masks on, we'd breathe deeply, and we would be reminded of that song that you give the breath to our lungs, Lord. I pray that you'd give us a sense of peace. Has, I don't think, God, that Evangel has ever needed more peace in its history than right now. I just pray that there would be peace that covers this campus. May the spirit of the living God fill us and comfort us and make us more curious about what you have to say by the end of today. In Jesus' name, amen. So March 12th of this year, uh, Lisa and I, with our kiddos, we got in a car and we started driving to Arkansas because it's a short drive and it was spring break. And so we're like, hey, we get to go. It's spring break for the kids. Let's go. Even if it's to Arkansas, if you're from Arkansas, it's not bad. It's great. Okay. But uh, this was a small cabin. I wasn't saving myself there. It it was a great place. It was a small cabin and we're going, let's get away for a weekend. And we drive there and I'm looking at the news. Lisa was driving. I wasn't driving. I was looking at the news and I said, oh no, Springfield, Missouri has its first COVID case, March 12th. And then we look at each other and we go, well, good thing it's spring break because uh, now the schools have a whole week to figure this out, you know? What what are they going to do at school in a week? (laughs) And here we are, September 1st. I was listening the other day to a pastor, I won't tell you who it is because I, I still want you to listen to their podcast, and I know you would know who this is, and it was a message from back in April, and this is what the pastor said, with a sense of certainty and, and wanting to bring hope. He said, I, I believe and I feel in my heart that in 30 days, things will be different. 30 days from now, things are going to change. The dawn is breaking, and everybody's cheering, and they're going, yes, and he goes, God's mercies are new, and they're going, yes, and he says, in 30 days from that, things will be different, and 30 days from that, and he goes on and on and on, and it's cheering, and I just turned it off, and I go, we're like 30 days times five, and, and we're still wearing masks, and, and listen, 2020, what a year. 
It's longer than we ever expected. And here's how we deal with 2020. Uh, We've been sending memes to each other. (laughs) That's how mature Christians handle uh, such complicated times. We send things like this. Me prepared for 2020. Straight in the eyes, man. That, that's how I felt. We send each other things like this. March 1st. March 31st. 30 days later. Yeah, things change. Not a new dawn. It's still nighttime and I'm, I'm almost dead. Okay. This is, if you can't read, it says, I was your pilot. Someone sneezed. Good luck. You know who sent me that? My dad, who is a Southwest pilot. This is Obi-Wan training Luke, and at the bottom it says, okay, let's see here. After you've logged in, you're going to want to go to the student portal and click Jedi. Things have changed. Ladies, time to start dating the older dudes. They can get you in the grocery store early. Listen, you know why we do this? I don't know why we do this, but I have a hunch. You know why we do this? You know why we send each other funny memes? And If we actually sat in what's happening for too long, uh, I don't know if we'd get up. Too much has happened too fast, and we're too confused. And to be honest, what I, what some of the things I found out is if you feel deeply, once you feel deeply, which all of you do, you start to ask questions a lot. And when pressure squeezes in on you, the, the questions start to pop out of you. And one of the questions we're all wondering is, like, what, what do we do when it's scary? What do we do when it's scary out there? This is what I want to talk about. What to do when it's scary out there? It, it's a scary time. We have all kinds of questions. I mean, everything from coronavirus, which I know you have friends on this campus that are in quarantine, And I I know that you've had family members that have been affected. We've had family members that have been affected. And then you have the civil unrest. You have the division that's happening in the country. You have the racial injustice, which we'll be actually talking about on Thursday. You have that that's going on. And why don't we throw in some wildfires and a few hurricanes, and let's put it all in an election year, and let's see what happens. I mean, it, it is scary out there. It's scary. It doesn't feel comfortable when you have to put on a mask. It's, the anxiety is heightened. You know, in my life, uh, Greg talked about it, but in the last few years, I've been, I don't, the adjective that's described me in so many articles and different things has been doubter. And my middle name is Thomas, which is like, this has already been taken, this has already been done, okay? But it's not the most flattering thing, but I understand. In Bible college, I... Uh, really just went into the season of doubt where I was going to the doctor and I was saying, please find something wrong with me. Tell me if my thyroid's off. Take my blood and give me a pill because the Savior's not working. I, I, was, I was, give me something because the doubts were abundant. I didn't even know you could think that much. And, uh, and then fast forward to when we were in Denver a few years ago, we started the Doubters Club, which is where Christians and unbelievers come together, they model friendship, and they pursue truth together. And to this day, some of my best friends are atheists, and we're pursuing truth together. Why would I do that alone? Why would I do that by myself? Let's do that together. And what I've realized is there's really three major worldviews, the way that we see the world. I mean, you can break it down into more academic ways of saying the Eastern religions and the secularists and the Christians or uh, the Jews or the Muslims. You could break it down into those three but what, what I would say is, let, let's just look at the questions that they ask. And, and this is the lens that a lot of them see it through. The Eastern people would say, what can we know? <laughs> They're going, what, what knowledge can we have that's going to help us escape from the reality of what's happening? And uh, there's, the New Age movement would be included in that. The secularists would go, what can we predict? You know, what, what can I uh, touch, feel, and see and by feel, I don't mean here, I mean on your fingertips. What, what can we predict? We can only live by what we can predict, and they're making all these predictions. And here's what the Christian says. The Christian, believe it or not, all throughout the Bible, goes, what has happened is the question. That's actually the lens. What has happened? You look in Romans, the book of Romans, it tells us when the world was created, when the universe was created, there's these invisible qualities and attributes about God. Something has happened. And it tells us namely about his power. And we're going, okay, so something has happened when we look back. 
When you look back in history and you go, okay, the death of Jesus has happened. What does that tell you? It tells you something about the love of God in your life. Like that God's deeply in love with you and the resurrection has happened. What does that tell you? Well, it tells you that death isn't the end. That the, the fear of death is losing its grip on you. Something has happened. Christians ask, what has happened? And no time in my life more than right now have I realized how important it is to be a Christian. Because if I, if I try to go, what can we know? Good luck. The experts are perplexed. If I tried to go, what can we predict? Uh, nothing right now. But what has happened, that's different. That's a different question. So when we go, it's scary out there. I want to I take you to a discipline that will stir your curiosity. And, uh, and it's a word that you're going to be like, I came to chapel for that word? I've heard that word way too much. It's not the words that you heard in high school way too much that you were told not to say. Not those words. This word, this word is faith. In times of uncertainty, the best thing you can do is to exercise faith. Now, here's, here's what faith is. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, listen. So faith is confidence, okay? It's not, it's not that complicated. Hear me out. It's being confident in what you hope for. So it's like this. When I asked Lisa to marry me, and uh, I got down on one knee, it was a beautiful, beautiful time. We got pictures for an all, and I said, will you marry me? And she said, yes. At that point... The next day, if someone came up to me and said, hey, is Lisa going to marry you? It would be foolish of me to say, I don't know. I don't know what she's thinking. How am I? Of course I do. Based on something that happened, I now have confidence in the hope that I had. I hope she would say yes. If she said no, uh, I, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have kids. I, whatever. It would be a very confusing life. But she said yes. She said Yes. It's like when you're hoping for a grade and you're going, I have hopes, I have hopes, I have hopes that I'll get an A. I have hopes I'll get a B. My goodness, some of you are like, I have hopes I get a D. I just have hopes I get a grade that's going to get me past the finish line even if I'm like crawling past it. That hope turns into confidence the minute your professor responds in an email and says, yeah, you got a B. Congratulations. The, the hope you had turns into confidence. The reason Christians look backwards in confusing times is because they go, that's where our confidence comes from. Something happened back there that I can anchor down in. So here, here's what I want you to know. It, when it comes to storms of uncertainty, you don't need answers. You need an anchor. You don't actually need answers right now. Look, if you could ask Jesus, will I get COVID? And he said, Yes. Then your next question is going to be when, and then it's going to be how. And if he said no, you would say, okay, how do I avoid it? And what about my family members? If you ask Jesus, what's going to happen when I graduate? And he says this, and you go, I don't know if I like that. It's because he hasn't changed your affections yet. You're not there yet. Answers aren't what you need. What you need is an anchor. This, this is an anchor. Okay, this is what you need in storms of uncertainty. Your life is like a boat. You are like a ship out on sea right now. And you came to college going, I see blue waters. <laughs> I see uncharted territory that I'm going to take. And now you're like, oh, dear God, I see a major storm. <laughs> Those waves are high. And you're a ship out on sea. And you know what ships do whenever there's a major storm? They find a place and they anchor down. They anchor down. And, and in fact... I'm going to share with you what they do according to sailors and according to fishermen. And, and my new boss at CMN, he used to go out on boats for weeks to catch fish. So here's the first thing that they do. In storms of uncertainty, you analyze your surroundings. Here's what fishermen do when they anchor down. They look around and they go, okay, here's the reality of what we're dealing with. Okay, the reality is... Things are hard. Here, here's the reality. The reality is I'm scared. The reality, and you go, this is stupid. Why would I have to admit that? Because it's so hard to admit. It's so hard to get to a place where we go, there's a story. It's so much easier to drown out the voices 
through things like music, TV, social media, all this stuff, but your soul needs to say something. Your soul needs to acknowledge, here's, here's my surroundings. Here's what's going on. In fact, if you're going to make it through any storm, you have to be able to say, there's a storm. It's how hard it's raining. I'm scared. Big waves are coming. There's a time in March where I actually, I, uh, I went in my closet. I wish I could tell you I was going in my prayer closet to, to pray away the fear. No, I went in my closet because I didn't want my daughters to see me cry. I was, I was just on the edge of a breakdown of going, my anxiety is so high. Now, could I actually tell you why? I couldn't tell you why. I don't know if it was fear about my kids. I don't know if it was the uncertainty about school. I don't know if it had to revolve around my grandparents. I don't know, what it, I don't know if it revolved around the economy. I don't know. I think it was all these things put together. And I go in my closet and I call my spiritual mentor, and I said, uh, I, I remember saying, I need you to not talk about this conversation with people, and here I am talking to you about it, and, and I just lost it. I said, it's like raging out there, and not just out there. The problem with storms is like what it causes in here is really terrible, and, uh, and he walked me through it, talked with me for over 45 minutes. I'm on my knees in the closet praying. And I just want you to know, that's a real discipline. So sailors actually tell you, and, and by the way, these five steps aren't five points to a sermon that I came up with. These five steps are according to uh, sailors and fishermen, what they do in a storm. Analyze your surroundings. Dive your anchor. It... it it's said of the physical reality of what we're talking about, before a storm comes, you want to be able to dive down. Now, the good news is you can do that in this setting because this is a safe place. You're in an academic setting where you could dive down. But before you drop your anchor, okay, and, you, and it's going to go down and it's going to hold the ship in place, you, you actually want to dive oh, You actually want to dive deep. You, you, you want to dive as deep as you can to where you can see. You want to be able to visually see what am I going to anchor into. What's the ground like? And here's where it's really important. We don't go after Christian cliches like if God brought you to it, he's going to bring you through it, right? We, these, although cliches are meant to be helpful and stuff, tell that to the rest of chapter 11 when they're talking about the heroes of faith who have died for their faith. And they're going, God brought me to it and then it killed me, right? And so they're, I mean... You dive your anchor in something real, not in cliches. We don't dive our anchor into bumper stickers. We drop our anchor into something real. You want to know something that's real right now? God's still in control. He's never lost control. I mean, God has us set our minds on him. Why? Because he's in authority. He's the one in control. I mean, this is still real. What's still real is that Jesus did die and come back from the grave and the threat of death on your life that, you, that may make you anxious can be brought to him because he's experienced it before. This is real. And we dive our anchor into reality of the gospel. What has happened? This is why the psalmists look backwards before they look forward. Here's number three. Let out enough scope. Scope would be that slack on the chain or the rope. And the reason you let out enough is because it helps dig the anchor into the ground. So I want to tell you this, and this is going to liberate some of you, but in this storm, you're trying to be so certain, and you're trying to put a strong front, and nothing's wrong, I hate the mass, I'm just so, whatever. You're trying to do all this, and you you're, have such a tight rein on your anchor, it actually hasn't even hit the ground yet. It's not gone into something. And it's so rigid that one more blow from that storm Whenever, we don't know what, what September holds, but wait till October. When October comes and it hits you, the anchor's up. Anchor's gone. The reason we let out scope is it digs the anchor in, which means, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of uncertainty in our life. There's going to be the reality of going back and forth. Not in the way James talks about where he says you're going back and forth from wisdom, from God's wisdom to man's wisdom. No, that you're just going back and forth in uncertainty. That you're going like this. I don't hear the voice of God clearly. He's not speaking as clearly as he was before. I don't know what it's going to look like to date someone and have to kiss through a mask. I don't know. And you're going back and forth. You let out a little bit of scope. 
It's amazing that the heroes of the Bible listed in the rest of chapter 11 are actually the ones who let out scope. They're the ones who go, I trust, I have confidence. You know what's not in the definition of faith? Certainty. You know what it is? Confidence. And these are people who go, I had confidence in God. And at the end it even says, and they died with faith. They let out scope. Here's the next one. Check your anchor alarm system. This, uh, I want to stay here for just a minute because your anchor alarm system, system is when, when you kind of tell the computer and the ship what radius you feel comfortable being sloshed to and fro in. Whenever you go outside of that radius, then the alarm starts to go off. And I, I do believe you need some spiritual alarms. There are some boundaries that you need to set when it comes to uncertain times. Because you're anchoring down, but you really need to know, okay, I need to know when the spiritual alarm is going off, things aren't okay, it's for your health. It's to make sure that you're going to make it through. Here's some that I have. When I, when, I, when I realize that the storm's going, I go, okay, what I set my mind on will determine my mindset. I know this to be true of me. Look, I, I know there's a reason why Colossians says, set your mind on things that are above, and then it says right after that, because Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Christ, you set your mind on things that are above because Christ is there. We don't set our mind on anxiety. We set our mind on authority. I know this about myself. I know this about myself is uh, when I don't like the outcome, I have to check the input. This is true for me. If I'm looking at the news and I'm soaking it in all the time and I'm talking to people that are not hopeful, even in doubters club settings, I have to be careful. And, I'm, and if that's the input, the outcome is going to be a very anxious Preston. It's going to be a very unengaged father. It's going to be a very tired husband who doesn't want to go on a date. I'd rather go to sleep. I mean, that, that's what's going to happen if I'm not careful. And here's the last one in my alarm system is I don't want to be ignorant of it, but I do want to influence it. And I know if I'm ignorant and, I, and there's enough times I go, I didn't know that, I didn't know that, I didn't know that, I'm not analyzing the storm and there should be a spiritual alarm that's going off. You need to know what's happening and then you need to lead through that, through the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then here's the fifth one, have anchor faith. And listen, I didn't change the word, I didn't do anything. That's actually on the website uh, when it comes to safety of anchoring, have anchor faith. Have anchor faith. Like, you got to have faith that this sucker is going to work, okay? When we're in a storm, and if we're all together in a ship, and we toss this anchor out, and it goes down, and we give enough slack, and the storm's going, we go, hold steady, everybody. Hold steady. I have faith in this. I know this. I know what this does. And so for you, here, here's what I want to leave you with. I want to leave you with one confidence that you can toss your faith into. That's what I want to do. That in this storm, I think there's actually one confidence we can have. The confidence is you are God's very good idea. He loves you deeply and he could have a world in which you didn't exist. He did not want that world. He wanted you to exist in this moment. Why? Because what I know is that he created the whole world and everything in it, and he knit you together in your mother's womb. So you can toss your faith into that and know, I was made for this. I was actually made for this moment. And the way God knit me together with all my anxieties and all, I was made for this moment. I, I can do this. You know, when I talked about our family earlier, the, uh, I told you about Diggory the dog. Um, but what I didn't tell you is we have a new family member coming. It's not a baby. It's a, it's a new puppy. Now, yeah, see that? My kids are still cuter, okay? This is... You guys can uh, start playing. We'll go into a time of worship in just a second. That, that puppy is named Polly. Polly and Diggory come from the Chronicles of Narnia. Puppy's named Polly. She's a Morky, Maltese, Yorkie, and she doesn't even exist yet. It's just a picture of one of her brothers and sisters that she'll never meet. In fact, there's a litter that was supposed to be had yesterday. It didn't happen yet. We don't know if it's going to be that litter or if it's going to be the next litter or the one after that, but we already put a deposit down for Polly. And what we know is 
our kids are drawing pictures of Polly, and we're all excited for when Polly comes into the world, and there's a deposit that's made for Polly. She's not even here yet, but we know she'll be here, and there's excitement around her, and we're preparing the house for her. And this is what you can sink your anchor in today, is before you existed, there's excitement about your life. God goes, I don't want a world in which you don't exist. I want the world in which you exist. You're already in his wallet. You already have a name. You're already on his fridge. God has excitement about you. You are his good idea. You sink your anchor into that and you know, hey, he could have had me be born in a different time. He didn't want me to. He wanted me born. He could have had me in college at a different time. He didn't want me to. He wanted me in college at this time. He could have had me do any of these things. He didn't want me to. And for that reason, before I was even born, there was a deposit made that said, hey, they're mine. And Jesus declares it on the cross. He goes, you're mine. This is a deposit. And they're all not even born yet. But some of them will be at Evangel in 2020. And what a year it'll be. You got to sink your anchor today into that. You don't need more answers. You just need your anchor overboard so you can hold steady. Stand with me. We're going to pray. And then I'll come up and dismiss us. But since we can't have an altar time, I, I, I want to start us off with the prayer that's going to springboard us into a time where we say, I, I have confidence now that I was made for a moment like this because the God who made me was excited about me before he made me. And there's a deposit that was made. So let me pray for us. God, I thank you that uh, in this room, you knew us all by name. You knew every hair on our head. I thank you that God, you're the way that you see the world, you didn't see that it would be okay without us in it in this moment. I thank you that, God, these are true. This is what we know. This has happened, God. I just pray you'd give us confidence now to anchor down into this today. Let us know that no matter what tomorrow brings, we actually don't need to know what tomorrow brings. We need to know that we're deeply loved today. And we anchor in that. So, God, as we worship, may we feel your presence. I even pray there would be a calming of the storm, the peace of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.